Well, we can start for the first session. Uh, the first paper, Georgios uh, Georg Gatis from the European uh, Central Bank. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, uh, amazing place um, and looking forward to the conference, to the discussion and the comments. Um, the paper I'm going to present is a very straightforward paper. It's about global spillovers from Fed monetary policy and with a particular emphasis on spillovers across the measures in the Fed's uh, toolkit. Let me illustrate what I mean with uh, different measures in the Fed's toolkit using this FOMC press release from 2022. It's kind of old, but it's actually from the first time when I presented this paper uh, externally outside the ECB. So what you see here, highlighted in red, yellow and blue, are those three dimensions of Fed monetary policy that we're going to look at in this paper. In red, you see that at the time the FOMC decided that it would raise the target range of the federal funds rate. So that's a conventional rate policy dimension we're going to look at. In yellow, you see that it expected that there would be ongoing increases, additional increases in the target range. That's the forward guidance component. And in blue, you see that the Fed at the time decided that it would unwind the uh, various assets that it had purchased in uh, various programs. And this is the LSAP, the large scale asset purchase um, a dimension that we're going to, to look at in this paper. So I think especially uh, in this room, we know that there's a lot of discussion about the uh, external effects of Fed monetary policy. If you look into the empirical literature, there's uh, commensurately um, much work on this. There's a lot of empirical work on Fed monetary policy spillovers. Giovanni has a very prominent paper, my discussant. I have an older paper on this. But if you look a little bit more closely at this literature, you will see that there's very little work that does two things at the same time, namely to look at the different uh, measures in the Fed's toolkit and its spillovers across the world, and in particular within a unified framework in terms of identification. And the second thing is to account for the possible presence of residual endogenous components in the typical external instruments that are used in this literature. Now, I'm going to say more about this later on, but under these residual endogenous components, you would uh, uh, subsume things such as a central bank information effect. So very little work that does these two things at the same time, look at different measures in the Fed's toolkit and account for things such as uh, uh, central bank information effects. Now, looking at these different measures and their spillovers to the rest of the world is important, at least for two reasons. One, optimal local policy responses may differ depending on what the Fed is doing in terms of measures and how these measures are transmitting to, to the rest of the world. Another reason is that there may be more recourse to unconventional measures in the future if the zero low bound happens to, to bind more frequently. Okay, so concretely what we do in the paper, we look at the spillovers to the rest of the world across the measures in the Fed's toolkit. We try to tease out from the data which transmission channels are at play, and we're going to uh, have a little look at the possible uh, trade-offs, especially in emerging markets, that these um, uh, spillovers uh, induce. We have three sets of findings. The first set of findings relates to the magnitude and the, the degree of uh, how consequential these spillovers are. We find that Fed spillovers are consequential for the rest of the world. Now, this in itself is really not a new finding. There's a long literature which has already documented this. What we add in the paper is resolution. We had resolution in terms of heterogeneities across the different Fed measures. And what we find is that Fed spillovers are particularly large for forward guidance and for LSAPs, not so large for variation in the current policy rate, at least if you hold constant forward guidance, the expected future path of, of policy rates. When I say consequential, I also mean beyond the size of spillovers, also there are the challenges that they imply for, uh, for, for central banks in emerging market economies. We find that both forward guidance and LSOPs, they entail uh, trade-offs for monetary policy in emerging market economies, in part between stabilizing output and prices, but also in part stabilizing the macroeconomy, output and prices, on the one hand, and stabilizing uh, or preserving financial stability uh, on the other hand. Second set of finding is that accounting for residual endogenous components in policy surprises in these external instruments is important. Again, this is not a new finding. What we add is resolution. 
we show that this is particularly important in the context of forward guidance. Okay. If you don't account for these residual endogenous components, that, then you will get uh, effects of for forward guidance that are implausibly small. Third set of findings, risk channels are really key for the transmission of Fed monetary policy to the rest of the world. This is true both for forward guidance and for LSAPs. And that's particularly interesting because for LSAPs, um, international portfolio rebalancing has been proposed very recently as an important transmission channel. And we do find evidence for international portfolio rebalancing, just that at the end of the day, the associated spillovers in term premia are relatively small. Okay, so let me spend a couple of minutes on the literature in order to locate this paper and to illustrate what we are contributing. So there is a big literature, as I already mentioned. A first wave just looked at Fed spillovers to the rest of the world without accounting for central bank information effects and other residual endogenous components, and also not distinguishing between different measures. Then there was a second wave, which tried to tease out these central bank information effects and other components, looking at pure Fed policy shocks. At the same time, a literature that tried to look at different measures in the Fed's toolkit. And more recently, I think a literature or a strand of a literature has started that tries to do both things at the same time, purify these external instruments from non-policy shock components and look at uh, different measures in the Fed's toolkit. To the best of our knowledge, there's just one paper that does this. And we argue in the paper that, the, uh, that technically the way they try to tease out these um, uh, um, central bank information effects may be uh, problematic. In a nutshell, they're using one auxiliary variable to tease out information effects from uh, uh, three dimensions of, um, of Fed monetary policy. So we're going to make use of an identification approach that Marek uh, proposed in a very recent paper. That's why it's also a very straightforward paper. We take his identification, we plug it in into the uh, context of Fed spillovers, and we, and we see what we get. So let me show you how this identification works. I want to step, uh, make one step back in order to make sure that we're uh, roughly speaking, all on the same page regarding the high-frequency approach of uh, monetary policy shock identification. So this is the industry standard in this uh, profession, I would say, and it builds on using asset price surprises in a narrow window around uh, meaningful uh, monetary policy meetings, FOMC meetings, in order to get a proxy of the unobserved underlying monetary policy shock that's happening. And this works well if you, do, uh, if you make two assumptions. One, full information, rational expectations on the side of financial markets. And two, if you're confident, then you can uh, set up a window around an FOMC meeting that's sufficiently tight so that you can rule out that shocks other than monetary policy shocks occurred in that window. Now, this is the basic uh, high-frequency identification approach. It has been extended in various ways. One is by the Fed, extended to um, uh, teasing out from these high-frequency surprises measures for shocks to forward guidance and to LSAPs. Another extension is to relax full information rational expectations, which gives rise to uh, the possibility of these residual endogenous policy surprise components. These could be central bank information effects. I'm going to explain this in more detail later on but could also be other components, such as Fed response to news or non fisherian effects. Usually in the literature, uh, additional information is exploited in order to tease out these residual components. Marek's approach is uh, different. Marek's approach starts from the observation that these asset price surprises around FOMC meetings are non-Gaussian. They are leptocortic, they have fat tails, or in other words, they're usually very, very small. These surprises tend to be very close to zero, but occasionally they are very large. And so against this background, he postulates that for every FOMC meeting M, the observed asset price surprises that you can collect in, in a vector Y come about uh, as the result of some unobserved, monitor, sorry, unobserved structural shocks U uh, through a linear mapping in C. Okay? So he assumes that these Unobserved structural shocks have fat tails, and that's actually the reason why the observed asset price surprises have fat tails. Now, an important thing to recognize here is that as soon as these structural shocks U have fat tails, they're non-Gaussian, then orthogonal rotations of U and C, they're associated with different likelihood functions. So you can just apply maximum likelihood and estimate these structural shocks. Now, he then proceeds in the standard way. He uses the, uh, the GSS uh, data set, which covers 241 FOMC meetings between 1991 and 2019. And he uses four asset price surprises from this data set, namely surprises in the current month, uh, 
uh, Fed Funds Future, the two and the 10-year Treasury yields, and the S&P 500 index in this vector YM, and then he estimates the model, backs out the, the unobserved structural shocks. Now, I was hesitating, I was stuttering for uh, a moment, uh, uh, a moment ago, because the structural labeling is not part of this identification. This is a statistical identification approach. The structural labeling of these shocks occurs ex post. So once you've estimated the structural shocks, you're looking at the patterns that these shocks induce in financial markets, and then you're trying to compare this against economic theory and say, okay, this effect or this pattern in this effect looks like this shock is reflecting X, Y, Z. Okay? This is very similar to what Rigo Bon, for example, has uh, proposed in the identification through heteroscedasticity. It actually is part of a broader uh, agenda that uh, um, is called uh, independent component analysis, so identification based on statistical properties. So let me how Marek does this in the context of our paper. So these charts are from our paper. It's an extension of what Marek had done in his own paper. So what you see here in these four bar charts are the impact day effects, the estimated impact day effects of the four structural shock that Marek estimates. In the first five rows, you see this on the treasury yield curve with different maturities. In the next four, you see it on the associated uh, risk-free expectations components, then in the uh, term premium components, and finally in the uh, uh, S&P 500 in equity prices. And whenever these bars are filled, it means that the effect is estimated to be statistically significant. So let's look at the first column. So what you see here is that Marek's first shock is estimated to lift the treasury yield curve, especially at short maturities. Then you see that this shock is estimated to lift the treasury yield curve exclusively through the expectations component, through the risk-free component. Then you see, finally, that it's associated with a contraction in equity prices. And so then you contrast this with what economic theory predicts, and you say, OK, this looks pretty much like what a conventional rate policy shock would do. And so Marek labels this as a conventional shock. Second column, second shock, again, lifts the treasury yield curve, but only at medium to long-term maturities essentially only through the, uh, through the expectations component, and also leads to contraction in equity prices. Looks pretty much like what a forward guidance shock would do. Third column, third shock, lifts the treasury yield curve only at long maturities, only through the term premium, not the expectations component. And so this looks pretty much like what uh, an LSAP shock would do. So here you see that there's no statistically significant response of equity prices. Giovanni, I think, is going to spend some time on this, so I'll comment on this later on. Fourth shock lifts the treasury yield curve exclusively through the uh, expectations component, but raises equity prices. And so this is what the literature typically has uh, labeled as a central bank information effect. There's a, cent, uh, there's a surprise tightening in monetary policy. But this is interpreted by financial markets as conveying that the Fed is holding a more bullish view about where the economy is going, and so financial markets upgrade their earnings expectations and eventually equity prices go up. Now, let me emphasize again, this is an ex post labeling. So whatever that fourth shock really is, um, the CBI label here is really just an ex post label. Okay? We could label this differently. And more importantly, especially in this paper, we're not going to be invested in the interpretation of a central bank information effect here. OK, so let me uh, emphasize here again that this uh, identification approach builds on relatively weak identifying assumptions, namely three. One, there are N unobserved structural shocks. These are fat-tailed, and they're mutually independently distributed. Okay, these are the three identifying assumptions. No recursiveness assumptions are needed. No sign restrictions are needed. No magnitude restrictions. And there's also no need to take and stand ex ante what these shocks are. Importantly, in his paper, Marek shows that you can relax or generalize all these uh, identifying assumptions and still end up with the essentially same time series of the structural shocks. So what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to take these structural shocks at the meeting frequency, temporarily aggregate them to the monthly frequency, and then look at their uh, effects on macroeconomic and financial variables at business cycle horizons. And so this is what you get for real activity effects, both in the rest of the world in terms of spillovers, that's the black solid line, and in terms of the domestic effects in the US, these are the, uh, the red cross lines. Real activity here is measured by IP industrial production. First panel shows you the effects of what has been labeled as the conventional rate policy shock, and then forward guidance LSAP and CBI effects. A couple of observations. The first observation is that what has been labeled as a conventional rate policy shock is not having any meaningful consequences, both in the US and in the rest of the world. 
I want you to remember again, this is a shock to the conventional policy, to the current policy rate for given forward guidance, so for a given expected path of the policy rate. Second observation, forward guidance shocks and LSAP shocks have uh, uh, large effects in the rest of the world, where by large means effects that are equally large as in the US itself. Now that observation is not really new. A lot of uh, empirical work documents that fed spillovers are really, really large. Um, of similar size as the domestic effects uh, in, the rest of, uh, in the U.S. itself. Here we show that this is the case both for forward guidance and LSAPs. And third observation, central bank information effects are expansionary at least in the rest of the world. They're also expansionary in the U.S. for unemployment, not for IP, as we estimated, but generally they're expansionary. And this is important because we show in the paper if you do not account for a central bank information effect, in teasing out unobserved monetary policy shocks from observed asset price surprises, then this variation ends up in the forward guidance shock. Okay? So you have a composite forward guidance shock, which combines the variation of the central bank information effect and the true forward guidance shock. And because they have qualitatively opposite effects in macro data, you will get attenuated uh, estimates for this composite forward guidance shock if you do not account for the central bank information effect. So in the following, I'm not going to show you any more results for the conventional rate policy shock and also no more results for the central bank information effect. Again, because we're not invested in this label of a central bank information effect. We're just invested in this finding that if you do not account for it, then you'll get implausible estimates for the forward guidance shock. Okay. So transmission channels, we broadly look at two types of transmission channels, trade and financial channels. In the context of trade, there is expenditure switching when the dollar appreciates as U.S. monetary policy tightens. This increases U.S. demand for rest of the world goods, so that's actually expansionary for the rest of the world. Expenditure reduction as the U.S. economy slows down. This reduces U.S. demand for, for rest of the world uh, goods for, the, for a given exchange rate. So in principle, at least when it comes to bilateral trade the, between the U.S. and the rest of the world, the uh, role of the uh, trade channel is ambiguous. Now, there are two important caveats here, uh, very important caveats. So far, we do not account for the role of the trade channel uh, through third country trade, through intra-rest of the world trade, which is arguably very important because of uh, dollar invoicing in global trade. Okay? So this is an important caveat. A related caveat is that we're not looking at the role of quasi-cost push shocks in global value chains because of dollar appreciation and the importance of imported intermediates. So in a way, the trade channel that we're going to look at is really focused on bilateral trade between the U.S. and the rest of the world. Let me move here. Okay, so we do find that U.S. imports from the rest of the world drop. They drop significantly, both uh, statistically and also economically. They drop more strongly than output in the rest of the world. However, if you do a back-of-the-envelope calculation, you see that U.S. sorry, uh, um, rest of the world exports to the U.S., uh, are only about 2% of uh, rest of the world output. So based on this back of the envelope calculation, the trade channel on bilateral trade between the US and the rest of the world cannot really uh, be an important uh, transmission channel for these spillovers. Then we look at financial channels, and these all revolve around these domestic and global financial accelerator mechanisms, which have been proposed in various uh, blends. They all center on variation in asset prices, exchange rates, and risk aversion, which then give rise to variation in net worth, the value of collateral, and eventually leverage. In the context of LSAPs, there is an important uh, um, transmission channel on international portfolio rebalancing. If you have investors that operate in segmented markets, preferred habitat investors, then if the net supply of assets in their uh, market changes, then this will have spillovers across markets. And here you can think about spillovers from treasury uh, markets to other uh, advanced economy sovereign bond markets, and this would manifest in term premium spillovers. And we're going to look at all uh, these uh, concepts that are highlighted in red here. Okay, so here you see the effect of forward guidance and LSAP shocks on rest of the world and U.S. equity prices in the first row. Uh, rest of the world effects are in black, solid line. U.S. effects are in, in red cross lines. And in the second row on um, uh, spreads, risky uh, spreads in the U.S. and the rest of the world. For forward guidance, we find that there's an immediate uh, tightening global financing conditions, very much synchronized across the U.S. and the rest of the world. For LSAPs, we find also very strong synchronization in financial conditions, but the tightening plays out only gradually over time, which is 
potentially, or which can potentially be rationalized by the fact that a lot of the LSAF shocks in, uh, around these FOMC meetings are actually related to announcements of future purchases and sales by the Fed. Okay, so on the day when these LSAP shocks happen, the net supply of assets in these markets is not still, is not yet changing. Could be rationalized by this. Okay, but let's zoom in on this one a little bit more. So what you see here is in the top row, the response of US investors' holdings of advanced economy bonds. Okay, we're not splitting here, we're not distinguishing here between uh, sovereign bonds, other public bonds and private bonds. This is only advanced economy bonds due to data limitations. And in the bottom row, you see the response of U.S. investors' holdings of emerging market economy bonds. All right? Now, international portfolio rebalancing uh, by uh, arbitrageurs that link uh, segmented markets would predict that you have a stronger response of U.S. holdings of advanced economy bonds. And this is what we get here. On impact in response to an LSAP shock, U.S. investors already shed their holdings or part of their holdings of advanced economy uh, bonds, and while they do not uh, yet shed their holdings of emerging market economy bonds. At the same time, if we look at the spillovers to foreign advanced economy sovereign uh, term premium, there are some. This is the black solid line. But this spillover is much smaller than the effect on uh, treasury term premium in the U.S. itself. And this is remarkable because, as you remember, the synchronization in global financial conditions for forward guidance and LSAP shocks in terms of equity prices and spreads was very strong. It's much smaller in the case of, of term premium. So from this, we conclude that this uh, international portfolio rebalancing and term premium spillovers are unlikely to be a key transmission channel for the Fed spillovers from LSAPs. Okay, so in the last part of the paper, we try to uh, look at whether Fed monetary policy induces trade-offs for monetary policy in the rest of the world, especially in emerging market economies. And the motivation for doing this is that there has been a lot of discussion about the, uh, uh, the fallout from US monetary policy, especially in emerging market economies. The buzzwords here are the monetary tsunami, but also these calls for rules of uh, the monetary game, or in other words, calls for more uh, international policy uh, coordination in which the Fed would internalize its spillovers to the rest of the world beyond uh, spillbacks. So what we do here is a fairly reduced form, high level, uh, uh, pers oh, the, what we take on here is a fairly reduced form, high level uh, perspective. Namely, we look at whether Fed monetary policy induces trade-offs or divergences in observed variables that uh, emerging market central banks uh, care about. And we're going to look at two types of trade-offs, namely trade-offs between output and price stabilization, which we're then going to uh, label as uh, macroeconomic stability. And then we're going to look at uh, trade-offs between macroeconomic stability on the one hand and financial stability on the other hand, which we measure by uh, portfolio inflows. So let's look at trade-offs between output and prices first. first row shows you the effect of forward guidance and LSAPs on emerging market IP, industrial production, and second row in emerging market uh, consumer prices. For forward guidance, you see that um, Fed policy drives uh, output and prices in opposite directions. Right? So there is a contraction in emerging market real activity, but actually consumer prices go up, which could be rationalized by um, the role of imported goods in consumer baskets by the pervasive uh, dollar invoicing in emerging markets and the dollar appreciation that's happening here uh, in the background. So for forward guidance, there is this uh, traditional macroeconomic trade-off between stabilizing output and prices. For LSAPs, we do not find this. It's a bit surprising because the dollar exchange rate appreciates by essentially just as much as in case of the forward uh, guidance. We haven't resolved yet why there is no trade-off here. One possible reason is that the uh, contraction in output occurs somewhat faster than in case of uh, forward guidance, but this is our finding at this point. However, at the same time as there doesn't seem to be evidence for trade-offs between stabilizing output and prices for LSAPs, there seems to be uh, evidence for, for a trade-off between macroeconomic stability on the one hand and financial stability on the other hand. You see here in the top row, we uh, replicate the responses of output and prices from the previous slide. For LSAPs, they are both contractionary. And in the bottom row, we have the response of emerging market portfolio inflows, which, which, which drop in response to this contraction with LSAP shock. All right? So if monetary policy were to loosen more in order to stabilize output and prices, 
this would discourage further uh, foreign investors and, and further contract uh, inflows, potentially threatening financial stability. Okay, so let me wrap up. So with this paper, we look at the implications of U.S. monetary policy for the rest of the world across the dimensions of the Fed toolkit, especially forward guidance and LSAPs are consequential, both in terms of the magnitude of spillovers, but also in terms of uh, central bank challenges. We uh, uh, argue that accounting for central bank information effects, or more generally, for, <clears throat> for residual components in policies or prices, is important. And we provide some at least tentative uh, evidence that the trade channel doesn't seem to be key. It seems to all rest on the financial uh, channel. And uh, here, uh, risk perceptions, risk aversion, risk appetite seems to be key, which is consistent with this narrative of the global financial cycle. So then I'll stop here and hand over to, to Giovanni. <laughs>